You know, Passover Seder is a time where you're supposed to ask questions. By the way, you guys are great. You're supposed to ask questions. And one of the reasons that we ask questions is to keep the interest of the children, but frankly, it also keeps us interested. So here's the question that I want to ask tonight. And it's one undoubtedly you've heard before. If you only had a few minutes to leave your home, what would you take with you? For most of us, thank goodness, that's theoretical. But for the Israelites, it was the real deal. It's exactly what faced our people when they left Egypt. Remember how they got the call? It was in the middle of the night. And here's what the Torah says. And Pharaoh arose in the night with all his courtiers and all the Egyptians because there was a loud cry in Egypt, for there was no house where there was not someone dead. He summoned Moses and Aaron in the night and said, Up, depart from among my people, you and the Israelites with you. Go, worship the Lord as you had said. Wow. 400 plus years probably in the desert. Get out of here. No time to contemplate. What did they take with them? What did our people take with us? There's some clues in the Torah. If you look carefully at what happened, the Torah actually tells us what our people took with us when they left Egypt. And I think what they took with them, just as what we would take with us if we had to leave, speaks volumes. So what did they take? Well, they took unleavened bread, right? You know that. There was no time for the thing to rise. They took matzah. And so we don't want to forget that. We, beginning with, we begin the Seder with the words halachmaanya, right? These were the blo- this was the bread of affliction. So that's no surprise. They took the matzah with them. Here's the second thing that they took. You remember when they crossed the Red Sea and they were dancing? You might have heard that Miriam was dancing with the timbrels. They took timbrels with them. There was no timbrel. There was no timbrel store when they were running away from the Egyptians. So they took timbrels with them and they used them to dance, to celebrate. You know what else they took with them? They took the gold and silver with them that it says, the Hebrew word I think is that they didn't take it from the Egyptians, they asked them, it's a shila. Would you give us your gold and silver? Very interesting teachings about that suggested that the reasons they were asked it allowed the Egyptians to some way do something nice for them. But nevertheless, they took the gold and silver with them and you know what they did with that? Just open up chapter 32 of Exodus, they built a golden calf, right? Then they took the bones of Joseph. Joseph, a promise had been made to them. If they ever got out of Egypt, they would take his bones with them. So imagine that. That night in Egypt, everybody's getting their things together to leave, but Moses is doing something else. Moses is looking for the coffin with Joseph's bones, and he took those bones with him when they left Egypt. And by the way, you know what he did with those bones? When the Israelites received the Ten Commandments, they put the Ten Commandments in one ark, and they put the bones of Joseph in a second ark. So matzah, timbrels, gold and silver, the bones of Joseph. What was the fifth thing? I never would have guessed it, but the Torah actually uses the word. It tells us. In all the things that I just said to you, it takes a little history, but there's no history needed here. Here's what the Torah says. So God led the people roundabout, by the way of the wilderness, by the way, we know now, more or less, that had we taken a direct route from Egypt to the promised land, 
It wouldn't have been 40 years. You know how long it would have been? 11 days. Had we taken the direct, had we not gotten lost, had God not said go here or there, they can map out the route now 11 days. But this is what the Torah says. God led the people round about by the way of the wilderness of the Sea of Reeds. Now the Israelites went up armed out of the land of Egypt. Here's the Hebrew. Hamushim alu b'nei Yisrael me'eretz mitzrayim. Hamushim. The Bible translates hamushim as armed. They had weapons. They had weapons. Now, Jews have not typically glorified weapons. You don't see our political leaders with a holster and a gun. But we also know that without weapons, we wouldn't survive. And Israeli soldiers and those on reserve know at any moment's notice, they have to have their weapons available to them. As I was saying to a group of parents earlier, uh, earlier in the week as we were studying, I said, you know, I love the line, believe in miracles, just don't depend on them. I want God to do everything God can do to protect Israel, and I want Israel to have the best damn weaponry ever created by human beings. I'm a realist. That's life. But Rabbi Jack Reamer points out, by the way, Rabbi Jack Reamer is in his late 90s, an extraordinary teacher who I came to know and studied much of what he wrote. Rabbi Reamer says, we really don't know what that word, chamushim, means, because it only appears one time in the entire Torah. Very rare for a word to appear only once. So I want to share with you Midrash. I don't usually quote Midrash. I do it when I think it really has, for me, a great insight. Midrash Tanchuma, which is a Midrash that goes back, I don't know, maybe 1,800 years, something like that, has a very interesting take. It says, Midrash, the Midrash says, what does the word Hamushim sound like? Chamesh, the number five in Hebrew, right? Echad, Shtaim, Shalosh, Shabbat, Chamesh, the five books of Moses, right? The Midrash suggests, and this is just an explanation or an interpretation, that only one out of five Israelites actually left Egypt. The others stayed behind. As a matter of fact, one rabbi there suggested only one in 500 left. The others left, didn't leave. Pretty shocking when they finally had the opportunity to be free after all those years, only one in five, or even less, took the opportunity to leave with Moshe, with Moses. Now keep in mind, this is an interpretation, it's Midrash. But whether or not it's true, I suspect what the Midrash is trying to convey is that it is very, very hard to leave the world we know, even when it's not great. And there are countless examples in history of how people chose to stay in trouble situations rather than make a move. I don't blame them. I'm not judging them. But I know it's hard to make changes. It's not easy to leave. Think, in some of our lifetimes, of Soviet Jews. Many left as soon as they could flee the Soviet Union. A terribly oppressive regime. Many came to Israel. I think nearly a million. But many of them stayed behind, particularly elderly Jews, because to learn a new language, to learn a new culture is difficult, but particularly at an advanced age. The Israelites who left with Moses achieved ongoing glory. We read about them every week in the Torah, and we read about them every year, a year later, right? They are the fabric of who we are. But the ones who stayed behind, we know nothing about. Simply, we're part of the dustbin of history. So what did our ancestors take with them when they ran from Egypt in their few minutes that they had? Matzah, quick recap, timbrels, gold and silver, the bones of Joseph, and Hamushim, weapons. But they also gave us something. They gave us their story. 
and we continue to tell this story in every generation. I mentioned at the beginning of the service that this is Shabbat Hagadol, the great Sabbath. It's the Sabbath before Passover. You may or may not know this, but traditionally rabbis didn't give sermons every week. Traditionally, they only give two sermons a year, Shabbat Hagadol and on Yom Kippur. And their sermons on those days, I'm told, would often last three or four hours. So we have plenty of time now to talk. <laughs> I'm not going to do that to you. Monday night is your Seder. And when we tell the story of our ancestors, of how God freed our people from Egypt, it is we who were redeemed, and it is we who are supposed to do all we can in some way to feel as though physically, to the extent possible, that we were there. And by the way, something that's been going around the internet and something I think is worth considering at your Seder table, leave an empty seat and an empty setting for the hostages in Israel. It's a powerful reminder. May they come home and may Elijah come to to the moments in our home as well. But add your own stories. Think of the courage that many of your grandparents or great-grandparents, indeed some of you, the courage that it took to leave your homes, to come to a new land, to learn a new language and a new culture here in the United States. We speak of a generation of Jews who left their homes made Aliyah, Think of those who did that, who moved to Israel, where they had to literally fight for freedom and have to fight, unfortunately, today. I hope that our children hear these stories. I hope that they hear them on Monday night. I hope they fall in love with these stories. And I hope when the time comes for them to tell their stories, they will want to tell it to their own children. And I have a prayer that our children tell these stories in a world where people are no longer oppressed, in a world that is ultimately redeemed, and that when we chant those last four words that are at the back of every Haggadah that has ever been printed in the world, those last four words, next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'ah Yerushalayim, God willing, when we chant those words at the close of our Seder next year, it will be a Jerusalem and an Israel at peace. Shabbat Shalom.